Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I am Jocelyn Bowling Dixon, director of the Newark Public Library. And we are so pleased that you are joining us to salute the defining links between the library and our Latino neighbors. Tonight, we kick off a six week celebration that includes an impressive list of events, including TAP talks by well-known authors and programs focused on music, dance, poetry, and activities for children and families. And it all centers on an incredible exhibit you will be seeing this evening entitled The Library and the Latino Community, celebrating 40 plus years of partnership. Let's, let's give a hand to that, yes. NPL's relationship with the Latino community is long and durable. I am so proud of the foresight and the commitment the library demonstrated in responding to our Latino residents whose populations and contributions continue to grow. Over the last 40 years, NPL has made a concerted effort to recruit Latino librarians, offer new services, and cultivate the largest collection of Spanish language materials in the state. The New Jersey Hispanic Research and Information Center is a phenomenal resource. And that's just not me talking. I hope you've had a chance to check it out. If you haven't, please do. But we did not do this alone. The diverse cultures making up our Latino Newark community all contributed to our programming and outreach, gave us important materials for our archives and kept us up to date on the services needed to empower and strengthen their communities. This dynamic dialogue is a perfect illustration of how a public library and its community can and should work together to benefit all. And now it is my honor to introduce Board of Trustees member, Miguel Don Mike Rodriguez, who will share some words on behalf of the board. Thank you, director. Uh, buenas noches. Good evening. Uh, today is uh, a great day for us, for the Latino in this nation, because uh, the Hispanic uh, contribution to this society, uh, the one that really know how much uh, are our contribution in the society uh, here, since that the uh, they uh, that they decided to declare the Latinos uh, or the, and the Hispanic monk in the United States, we feel proud. But uh, uh, what I, we have to really uh, be aware that we are human and we gotta work in together and we gotta support institution like this one that we are tonight. For me, this is. For me, this is uh, another uh, university where we land and we can let the community to use the facilities are here. And all the uh, important in the area is that the young generation uh, has to starting to use the facility and don't use this like happened to me now, because that's what happened today. They don't want to read a book. They don't want to uh, uh, see a good uh, movie or a magazine or whatever. What they like is to be with technology. Technology is great. It's something that is progress in any society. But the most important for me is that really we must uh, read a book, a good book. And for me, that's education. And this is the way. I got to say a few words in Spanish now for my a uh, Hispanic community who are here today. Yo me siento muy contento y orgulloso de estar aquí en la noche de hoy y ser miembro de esta institución tan gloriosa que hay en toda sociedad. La biblioteca es 
una a universidad para los que nos gusta la lectura y los que nos, gu nos gusta aprender. Tenemos que dejar a nuestra nueva generación saber la importancia de visitar lugares como estos. Y si usted no lo hace, usted está pecando de la ignorancia que algunas veces pecamos los seres humanos. But we have to continue to be proud, to be part of this society, be part of America, and at the same time, we must celebrate uh, with proud and a bit honored to be Latino. Yo soy un puertorriqueño muy orgulloso de mis raíces y siempre lo he demostrado y lo seguiré demostrando. Eh, no podemos tener miedo ni podemos estar escondidos. Tenemos que decir lo que somos. Ok. Thank you again uh, to really to hear uh, el sermón que yo doy, pero es part of my mission to let the community know really what I am. Que viva la hispanidad. Gracias, don Mike, por siempre venir y apoyarnos. Gracias. No la veo. Jocelyn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we're, um, now we'll hear some words from our uh, very supportive uh, friends of the HRC chair, Ernesto Diaz. Viva la hispanidad, everybody. Let's be happy for our day and celebrate uh, one of the most important times for our Latino community in Newark and in New Jersey. We have uh, 60 million Latinos living in the United States and more or less 1.7 million living here in New Jersey. So we must work to collect the history of Latinos as the Mikey mentioned and really work hard and we're working with Yesenia, with Ingrid, with Jocelyn to have a floor for the Hispanic Research Information Center. Uh, Yesenia has been here for so many years. Ingrid is a pioneer of the Friends of the HRAC since I know you and I know you knew Olga Weinheim who happens to be in an exhibit outside. When you walk outside, you see the exhibit that is one for the Mikey and one for Olga and one for friends of the HRAC. And these people have been really committed to be sure that the history of our community has to be told, it has to be spread as a teacher, as a history teacher. I believe that that's very important because one day, one person, one Latino or a, anybody could write a history book of the contributions of Latinos in our community. And thanks to the archives that are, be, are collecting that history, one day some historian will be able to write that history. And our children and great-grandchildren will be able to read that. And that's the objective of Friends of the HRAC, that we collect the history, that the voices are heard because in the past, usually minority voices are silenced and we need to change the history, how the history is being told. And that is a movement that is going on, especially after what happened to George Floyd, right? We now know the importance of trying to balance history. And I do appreciate the work that Ingrid, Yesenia and Juber, who is also a person that is working with the arch archives are doing. Now I have members here from the board of Friends of the HRAC. If you can stand up for a second, Hector, uh, Mercedes, Iris. And the refreshing thing is to see a young person that want to continue with the legacy. And people that have been participating in the community as the Mikey, we have Mercedes also for many decades, uh, been involved in Newark and in the history of Newark. So that's great to have. And Iris also in the government of the city has been involved. So it's great to have those board members to support this cause. So with that, let me do copycat and speak in Spanish too, because I don't want to be the only one. Bienvenidos todos y es un placer tenerlos. Estoy muy orgulloso. Yo soy colombiano. 
y ser presidente de una organización latina que lucha por mantener nuestra historia es fundamental. Y algún día tendremos un piso parecido a este, que va a ser el piso tercero, donde vamos a tener los archivos que Yesenia por tantos años ha recolectado. Y también vamos a tener nuestros libros y la sala hispanoamericana. How many of you have visited the sala hispanoamericana? Que es la colección más grande realmente de libros latinos en nuestra comunidad. So let's give a round of applause to the workers. There is some people that work here too, that we're helping with the event that work in sala, the sala hispanoamericana. So with that, Let's continue the hard work, support the Friends of the HRAC, uh, support our activities, support the events of the Hispanic Heritage Celebration, and it's for everybody. Be proud of the contribution of Latinos in New Jersey, and we should continue with the struggles of our cause in the Nowhere Public Library. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, real quick, uh, so those of you don't know, the Friends of the HRIC is a nonprofit corporation whose mission is to raise funds to support the work that we do at the HRIC. And to date, they've raised almost a million dollars in support of this project. Yeah. One little note, it's a group of volunteers. These guys do not get paid for their work. This is somebody, this is a group of people who know and are passionate about this project and put in the work that they do uh, to support us. So we appreciate that for sure. Um, now we'd like to hear some words from my mentor and friend, uh, librarian extraordinaire, Ingrid Betancourt, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the history of bilingual services here at the library. Good evening. Muy buenas noches. Muy buenas noches a esta maravillosa familia latina que nos acompaña aquí esta noche. Bienvenidos a su biblioteca. Welcome to your library here today. Public libraries are truly wonderful, really. They're open to everyone, to all. Their services and resources are free. And they are designed to serve everyone, everyone in the community without any exception. And you always have something interesting going on at the library. So I'd like to share a little library story. Some years ago, there was a, an older gentleman checking out his books at the circulation desk. And he was talking to the, the person who was assisting him, right? And in, in very heavily accented English, he shared with the person, the CERC staff member who was helping him, that he had just become an American citizen. The circulation staffer replied, oh my God, that is so wonderful. Congratulations, that's, that's just terrific. And the man smiled and said, yes. Before, I was a Latino man who spoke bad English, but now I'm an American who speaks damn good Spanish. I, I've had the privilege of working at the North Public Library for a very long time. I started here as an intern in 1980 during my last semester of graduate studies in library and information sciences at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Yep, all the way back in the last century, way, way back there last century. So at the time, the North Public Library was initiating a three-year federally funded program to begin providing meaningful and effective library services to Newark's large Latino population. I was offered a position as a librarian and was very excited to accept and to work with a team of two other Latinos, two other Latino librarians 
who had also been recruited to the North Public Library for this purpose, for this project. They were Danilo Figueredo and Jane Catanzaro. Um, we were the, they used to call us the Three Musketeers. Uh, we were the only Latino librarians in the system, the North Public Library system. Uh, a Cuban, Danilo, a Panamanian, Jane, and myself, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican. And there were only a handful of us in the whole state of New Jersey. Um, very, very few libra Latino librarians in the state of New Jersey and in the United States as a whole. So during my years at the, at the library, I've had the opportunity to contribute to the evolution of this institution and to witness the continued growth and transformation of the Latino community in the state of New Jersey. And I'm, I know that Juan will speak about that in a couple of minutes. Um, so in the, in the 80s, we, in the early 80s, we initiated a vigorous publicity campaign to educate the community about services and resources available to them here at the library. And to let them know that when they discover the library and they walk through those doors, there will be somebody here who spoke their language to welcome them and to help them. Um, I just have to do an aside. When I, I grew up in Puerto Rico, um, born and raised, and we libraries, especially 40 years ago, were very, very different. The public library model in Latin America was very different from the public library model here in the United States. Uh, public libraries, when I, when I grew up, were scarce and poorly funded, and they were open only a few hours, and, and you would go there for very serious stuff. You know, uh, you wouldn't go there to help get help getting a job or writing a resume or finding out about health issues. That's not what, what you would do. So uh, like me, who did not know about this until I came to the States in my 20s, um, I, I was like, oh my God, this is a great place, you know, and we can really use this. So I really was excited to be part of, the, of this movement to, to educate the community and to make the library more receptive and sensitive and um, able to, to work with the Latino community. So in the early 80s, we initiated um, this vigorous publicity campaign. We opened a Spanish language hotline so the Latino community could actually call that number and get their questions answered on the phone in Spanish. We grew, as we have, so many people have mentioned, the Spanish collection from a few shelves of dusty yellowing books in the corner of the stacks to the largest public library, to the largest public library Spanish collection in the state. We reached out to the community in many different ways. And we worked in partnership with Latino educational, civic, cultural, arts, and social services organizations. In 1989, we opened La Sala Hispanoamericana at the library as a dedicated service point staffed by Spanish speaking personnel at all times. Over the years, we expanded the concept of Hispanic Heritage Month to an annual Latino celebration that ran throughout the fall, through the fall, and offered Latino themed exhibits and a series of dynamic public programs and events. And in addition to providing programming also throughout the year. In the early 2000s, working in collaboration with Dr. Olga Jimenez Wagenheim, and this dedicated and generous group of community members, we began the work of establishing a historical archive of the Puerto Rican community in the state of New Jersey, the largest and oldest Latino community in the state. This active partnership with the Latino community has resulted in the creation of the New Jersey Hispanic Research and Information Center here at the Newark Public Library, which today houses the only Latin, the only Latino historical archive in the state. So for those of us who are old and remember the old commercial, we've come a long way, baby. I, I want to thank the friends of HRIC for their enthusiastic dedicated and steadfast support these last 20 years. And I also want to thank my colleague, um, 
Yesenia Lopez for setting aside her original career plans because she was going in one direction and Olga, Dr. Wagenheim said, mm, maybe not, Yesenia. Would you? And then little by little, Yesenia was captivated and excited and thrilled and just really interested in this whole idea of, of rescuing the history that is being lost. Because if we don't pay attention to it and we don't rescue it, then it just dissolves and goes away. And so she set aside her original career plans and joined this important endeavor and became the very first Latino art, Latina or Latino archivist in the state of New Jersey. And I also want to, to express my gratitude to all of the library colleagues who have worked with us over the years, over the last uh, four decades, um, interns, people who have come and worked with us and gone and come and move on to different things and, and really help us build what, you know, and get us to where we are today. Um, and of course, I wanna thank the Latino community, all of you, who have shown up and partnered with us for four decades to serve the public and to create a more inclusive, just, and dynamic city of Newark. Here's to the next 40 years, right? Next 40 years, thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. So I've been talking to you guys pretty much all night, and um, I'm just letting you know. Mi nombre es Yesenia López, y soy la directora del Centro de Investigación e Información Hispana de Nueva Jersey. <laughs> My name is Yesenia López, and I am the director of the New Jersey Hispanic Research and Information Center at the North Public Library. Um, and my role at uh, the NJHIC, I oversee the functions of La Sala Panamericana, whom you've all heard about, the Puerto Rican Community Archives, and the, Puerto uh, the Hispanic Reference Collection. Um, in addition to overseeing those functions, I'm also oversee Latino programming here at the main branch uh, library. And uh, with that, I, I cannot do it without those partnerships that we just talked about with the community. We've had Ecuadorian community come in and host a program, the Peruvian community come in and host a program, the Dominican community come in and host a program. We've had so many community members come in um, and partner with us to serve the Latino community. And um, just like that, I was presenting at a program one day, somebody, I presented to the audience, if you have an idea of a program that you'd like to see here at the library, come talk to me and let's let's make that happen. Um, happened a couple of years ago and sure enough, I was able to um, partner with a community member, Hector Perez, uh, who um, came to me with an idea and actually became a friend of the HRIC board member. So um, if there are any others out there who would like to partner, who have ideas uh, for programs, um, you don't have all the bits and pieces, let's make it work, right? Call me up, contact me, and let's and let's coordinate that. Um, the other role I have is to oversee the Hispanic Heritage Celebration. So give it up for the celebration, right? This is this room is really really quiet, and um, this is a Latino celebration. So we have to give it up at home. We made more noise than this for just two people. Let's celebrate. So, so every year our Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations consist of a different theme. Um, if we're celebrating over 40 years, you can imagine um, we're kind of running out of themes. <laughs> Every year, uh, every other year, we focus uh, the celebration on a specific Latino community. On the other year, we would focus on a theme that tied Latinos together. Um, this year, it was decided we're gonna talk about 40 years worth of doing this. We've reached um, and covered pretty much every Latino community in the state. Um, and I think that's something to celebrate, you know? <laughs> this is a diverse community and, and the library has been able to do that. So as, as we focus on different themes, we ex 
curate an exhibit in the gallery and we create a series of programs based on the theme. This year's is the Library in the Latino Community and celebrating 40 years of partnership. And uh, Diego will share with us um, our website where we have a list of programs. Today's open and reception. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a Latino Music and Movement Festival. Ya el 25 de septiembre, September 25th, will host un festival de música y movimiento. Va a ser dos días, el 25 de septiembre y el 2 de octubre. September 25th and October 2nd. So on the 25th, you're gonna come in and hear from Quilla Pacarina, an Ecuadorian folklore group. You're gonna learn some salsa lessons with Yaslin Sanchez. And we're gonna close the program with Segunda Quimbamba teaching us about bomba en plena. And of course we all get to participate because this is, this is a partnership. We got to make this happen. Let's participate, make some noise and dance. On the second day, you're going to come back for Oro de Mariachi. We're going to have a bachata dance lesson, and we're going to close it out with a tango lesson in history. Following that is going to be, <laughs> there you go, uh, scroll up just a little bit. Following that is October 14th, up a little bit more, there we go, Abriendo Caminos a first generation Latino college student. Is there any first generation Latino college students here? Yes. So this program is gonna be an intergenerational conversation. I've managed to bring on somebody who was a first generation Latino college student from the 1980s. Another person who graduated as a first generation Latino college student in the 90s, another in the 2000s, and another in 2019. And what we want to do is have a panel discussion to talk about what it was like being a first generation Latino college student in the 80s and now in 2019. You know, those first generation Latino college students of the 80s and the 90s or the 80s and the 70s, those were the movers and shakers. Those were the ones who established the Latino fraternities, the, the Latino, um, Latino student groups at the schools, Latino studies programs. And then in 2019, we have these Latino college students who are now taking advantage of these, um, these benefits that our first generation college students um, put into place back in the 70s and 80s. So join us for that. It's sure to be a great panel. Um, following that is another festival. We'll have Café con Letras, Literature, Art, and Laughter over two days. Un Café con Letras is going to be some artists and some authors who are going to come in and present their work. Um, and it's going to be with a little comedy, a little comedy, I'm sorry. Um, we'll have a comedian hosting the show. So I'm sure it's going to be a laugh. Um, we're going to close out this year's program with a scroll up just a little bit more. Reading with Maria Hinojosa. I'm sorry, scroll down. <laughs> Mariano Hosa, some of you might know, is an award-winning journalist, and she is going to be presenting her book, Once I Was You, and that's going to be moderated by Yvette Mendez, a pioneer in journalism here in New Jersey as well. So I hope you all get to come back for these programs. Today, we're here to kick off these series of programs and to celebrate the opening of the lot the exhibit, the library in the Latino community, celebrating 40 years of partnership. So this year's exhibit and public programs were made possible in part by funds from the Essex Council, Essex Council Division of the Cultural and Historic Affairs and the Friends of HRIC. And before I go on, I just want to share with you all a little bit of the exhibit. When you get a chance, I hope you got a chance to, to view it. If you didn't, please get a chance to walk around the gallery. But um, Diego, I'll put the video up now. We've invited some of our supporters, some of our partners um, to come in and contribute some words about the library. And here's just a snippet of what they had to say. The full video will be available in the lobby. It's actually playing now and will be playing throughout the exhibit, but check out. <laughs> Basically, when I was that young, I was just intrigued 
by the library as this humongous building where I can come and get books. I can sit with um, my friends and talk about what we were looking for, what we were looking at. And it was an opportunity to explore a world full of books, which I didn't have when I was growing up. So Saturday mornings included um, taking the bus from um, Ferry Street area all the way over here and walking to the library and spending my mornings on Saturday here with my parents. And specifically in this area, que es la Sala Hispanoamericana, where they have literature for um, adults and then they have the children's book. Um, my father will show me, you know, some of the books that he read when he was little. So I would sit down and read some books while he would use a computer. At that time, the computers were a box, so you had to type all the stuff. Um, he became aware of knowing how to use a computer because somebody from the library taught him. And then they taught me how to use a computer. And we were um, we learned how to fill out forms because my father will apply for jobs and try to learn English with books. So my life with my Saturdays were spent here when I was a young child. La biblioteca es una institución muy importante, para, especialmente para la comunidad latina, ya que nos da la oportunidad de expresar y poder documentar los eventos que han pasado aquí, especialmente en la ciudad de Madrid. Por los últimos 25 años, desde pequeña, he podido ser parte de diferentes actividades. Me recuerdo como cuando tenía 17, 16 años, eh, tuve la oportunidad de bailar es una presentación directamente a la celebrando el mes de la herencia hispana. Eh, bueno, siendo una mujer inmigrante, eh, llegué como joven aquí. Para mí, la biblioteca fue de mucha ayuda y de mucho soporte. Eh, tiene, tienen programas que a mí particularmente me ayudaron inmensamente. Eh, fui miembro uh, hace más de 25 años de esta biblioteca y todavía lo sigo siendo. My favorite has been actually the one about the Andean culture alive in New Jersey, which happened about two years ago. And my experience with more public library is extraordinary. I think coming to the library is developing the development when I first became in Puerto Rico, with the Puerto Rican State Library. And uh, we used to do many events here with the Puerto Rican community. Mm -hmm. Some of our supporters are here in the room, so I just want to say thank you, and I hope you like the video. <laughs> Please encourage everyone to check it out in the lobby. Um, on that note, I'd also like to thank the following people who helped with today's event and the Latino celebration. Um, our director, Jocelyn Dixon, Ingrid Betancourt, who I continue to learn from every day, and our HRC staff, if you're here, please stand up or wave. We got Hoover Ayala, Vanessa Castaldo, Emma Reyes, Aurelia Rodriguez, Cynthia Roman Sanchez, and this summer's Rutgers Honors Learning Living Scholars. You're not standing up. Tammy Galaza and Angie Ruiz. There we go. Thank you, guys. The team behind the scenes don't usually get enough recognition. So I wanted to make sure that we know who are the people who make this happen. And of course, I can't leave out my awesome library colleagues who helped make this all come together so pretty. Um, our development staff, our T department, our maintenance and security, our colleagues in the New Jersey room who provided a lot of the wonderful resources in the exhibit, and to everyone who helped with publicity and sharing our posts on social media, and most importantly, the Latino community. Thank you. If you all would like to get a tour of the exhibit, please give us a call, let us know. And, and we can schedule that, <laughs> we can schedule a tour. Um, one last thing, sorry, uh, like to, uh, silly me, <laughs> please thank the Board of, Tr North Public Library Board of Trustees, Domingo and Lauren. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, now to speak to us about the history of New Jersey's Latino community is one of the nation's best known Latino journalists, activists, and public intellectuals. A staff columnist for New York's Daily News from 1987 until his retirement from the paper in 2016. He's also co-hosted for the past 25 years the daily radio and TV show, Democracy Now!, and he currently serves as the Richard D. Hefner Professor of Communications and Public Policy at Rutgers University. His investigative reports on urban affairs, migration, and political troubles in Latin America have won widespread recognition, including two George Polk Awards, a founder and past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, he became in 2015 the first Latino elected to the Society of Professional Journalists New York Journalism Hall of Fame and is also a fellow of the New York Academy of History. He's the author of five books, including Harvest of Empire, A History of Latinos in America, a required text for nearly two decades at colleges across the country. And we have Linda Carter who came in here to tell me that's exactly what she did with her, kid, her students. And News for All the People, The Epic Story of Race and the American Media, a New York Times bestseller and finalist for the Robert F. Kennedy Award. As a young activist in the 1960s and 70s, he was a founder and leader of New York City's Young Lords Organization and of the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights. Please give it up for Mr. Juan Gonzalez. Thank you and good evening to everyone. And uh, gracias por la invitación para estar con ustedes esta noche para celebrar el mes de la herencia hispana. Uh, I want to thank Yesenia Lopez and Ingrid Betancourt for inviting me to share some thoughts with you on this Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. Uh, this is actually one of the few public events I've participated in with an actual live crowd in some 18 months, as we've all grappled with the enormous turmoil and tragedy this pandemic has brought to our lives. And as we've been driven onto Zoom and Skype and all those other remote meeting apps to conduct our day-to-day -day business. My congratulations to the library for the amazing partnership that it has developed, not only with users of the library, but especially for the rich and safe space it has created for the Latino community to utilize the amazing educational resources and archives that this wonderful institution continues to preserve and make available to anyone who needs it. And my wife, who is a professor of history at Latino studies at Rutgers testifies that she sends her students here regularly to mine the archives uh, and, to, uh, and to further the knowledge of the new generation that comes forward that has no idea of what came before them. It was Andrew Carnegie, after all, who once said, there is not such a cradle of democracy upon the earth as the free public library. This republic of letters where neither rank, office, nor wealth receives the slightest consideration because all obviously are welcome to use it. And I think Yesenia was talking about those uh, first generation college students of the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Well, I'm a first generation college student of the 1960s, right? Uh, and uh, one of the few Latinos at my college when I was uh, growing up. So I understand the importance of the historical legacy that the young people of today need to know in order to be able to deal with the problems that they face today. I've been asked to talk about the progress and changes that have occurred in the state's Latino community. I assume the invitation came not because of my great expertise in the Garden State in particular, 
After all, I've only been a resident of New Jersey now for the past five years when I started teaching at Rutgers. But because of all those years I spent as an activist and an advocate uh, in, that, in the Latino community nationwide and later as a journalist and as a researcher and chronicler of the evolution of this dazzling and complex phenomenon, we now know as the Hispanic or Latino or Latinx people of the United States. But having lived most of my life, either in New York City or in Philadelphia, and having spent decades traveling back and forth between those cities, and having spent many of those years in most of the major towns of this state and reporting on and interviewing countless Latino community leaders and working closely with them, I've managed to accumulate some familiarity with this topic. I remember back in the early 1980s when a lot of us helped to form the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, one of the most active groups was the New Jersey group of the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, which was led at that time by people like Ramon Rivera, uh, who was actually in the Young Lords with us in the 1960s, was the founder of Casa de Don Pedro, which I think is still one of the largest social uh, service agencies in this city. And it was Ramon Rivera, a former young lord, who started Casa de Don Pedro. And one of our big leaders back then was Ida Castro, who later became a commissioner uh, under McGreevy. And of course, the legendary Maria Canino. Uh, Marlene Lau was a youngster starting out in the National Congress of Puerto Rican Nazi, now the big wig now with Catholic Charities, I think, uh, uh, in Trenton. Uh, Felix Ruiz from Jersey City. These were all the people who were active at that time in the early 1980s trying to fight for equal rights and, and advancement of the Latino community uh, in New Jersey, which at that time was largely Puerto Rican. Uh, and, um, and all of these people were friends of mine. Of course, Hilda Hidalgo is a long time uh, a friend and a, co a colleague of mine. Uh, so I've had much more involvement with the New Jersey Latino community than just the five years that I've been a resident here. Last month, the census started releasing portions of its massive count of the US population, the most comprehensive and all important snapshot of the nation's people that we have. It's not perfect, but it's the best we have. We're not talking with the census about tweets or someone's opinion or make-believe narratives. We're talking about hard data that will determine government policy and spending priorities and election districts for the next decade. According to the census, there are now 62 million Hispanic. Uh, it, it was 60 last year, but now we have the official count. It's 62 million uh, Hispanics in the United, uh, the United States, 18.7% of the entire U.S. population. It's actually 65 million. If you throw in the 3 million in Puerto Rico, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico, which the census always lists separately from the overall U.S. population. Uh, that means that Latinos and residents of Asian descent continue to represent the fastest growing minority groups in the United States. And New Jersey exemplifies that growth. It's sometimes hard to imagine how astounding the demographic change has been in this country over just the 40 years we are commemorating tonight. I go back a little further, so you know, I'm in my 70s now, so I can go back 50, 60 years and understand the enormous change that has occurred. In 1980, there were 7.4 million people living in New Jersey. Back then, there were 500,000 Latinos, less than 7% of the total. The biggest group, more than 40%, were Puerto Ricans, followed by Cubans, about 80,000 Cubans. Those numbers already represented a breathtaking increase 
from 1970, when Latinos were less than 2% of the state. 1970, 50 years ago, less than 2% of the state. Go up to the next census in 1990. The census reported New Jersey had grown slightly overall in population, 7.7 .7 million. But Latinos had mushroomed to 720,000 or 9%. So by 1990, the population was up to 9% of the state. Puerto Ricans were still the largest group, not quite as large a share, right? Because something else had happened, which had large numbers of Colombians and Dominicans residents grew in the state. 10 years later, in 2000, there were 1.1 million Latinos in the state, 13%. So we're going 1% in, uh, 1 point something percent in the 70s. We, we, uh, and uh, uh, we go up to 9% uh, in the, the 90s, and now we're 13.2% in 2000. Puerto Ricans continued to grow, but they kept dropping as a percentage to about a third of the population, of the Latino population. And Cubans started dropping in both absolute numbers and percentages. So the Cuban community basically dwindled as a portion of the Latino population. But the biggest growth in 2000 came among Mexicans and Dominicans, both of whom registered more than 100,000 in number. Okay. Now we go to 2010. In 2010, Latinos skyrocketed to more than 1.5 million, or 17% of the population. And Puerto Ricans grew a little, but went down in percentage, and now 27, 26%. Perhaps the biggest surprise was that by 2010, Mexicans had become the second largest Latino population in, in, the, in the state. 2010. Most people are not aware of that, right? That Mexicans by then had become the second largest Latinx group. But there were new groups growing in size. Peruvians, Guatemalans, Hondurans, showing rapid growth. And this state was not only becoming more Latino, but it was becoming more ethnically diverse among the Latinos. You know, I always tell the story when I was a reporter with a, with a columnist at the Daily News and uh, in the early 90s, I get a call from a, a woman who was a big leader of the Catholic Church in East Harlem, Doña Carmen Levini. She calls me up one day and she says, Mr. Gonzalez, you have to, I know you from your young Lord days, you're a real uh, supporter of Puerto Ricans, you got to write something about these Mexicans. And I said, Doña Carmen, what are you talking about? She says, well, you know, in East Harlem now, the Mexicans are almost becoming like a majority. And wherever they go, they enter, they get, and when they become parishioners of a local Catholic church, they want the statue of La Virgen de Guadalupe put in the front of the church. <laughs> and she was, she was the, uh, the head of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of a, a social group of Puerto Ricans in that church, a Holy Agony Church. And she says, no, no, no. You can have a statue of La Virgen de Guadalupe in the back, but not in the front, <laughs> right? Uh, because she says, you know that for us Puerto Ricans, it's La Virgen de la Providencia, not La Virgen de Guadalupe, <laughs> right? And uh, so then she says, and now the Mexicans are saying that if they don't get La Virgen de Guadalupe in the front of the church, they're leaving and they're going to another church. So I said to her, well, Doña Carmen, what does the priest say about it? And she said, well, he's a Spaniard and he doesn't want to get involved. Uh, 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 and uh, so I realized that what was happening was that the Latino community of the United States was becoming so diverse that there were ethnic conflicts developing within the community. So that, and that in fact, every Latino nationality has their own image of the Virgin, right? For the Dominicans, it's Nuestra Señora de Altagracia. Uh, for the Cubans, it's La Virgen de Cobre, right? Uh, and so for the Puerto Ricans, it's uh, the, La Providencia. So the Battle of the Virgins became a way of, 
explaining the huge diversity that was occurring within the Latino community. Forget about the Italians and the Polish. They had their own versions uh, as well, their own images, the same version, just a different, uh, same version, just a different image, right? So, um, and that showed the complexity that was developing in the growth of the Latino community. So here in 2020, the results just came out about a month ago. And we don't have all the data city by city yet, but we have a pretty good idea of the overall state number. There are now 2 million Latinos in New Jersey. A, a jump of 474,000 people in just the last 10 years. In fact, the last 10 years witnessed the largest growth of the Latino community in this state in its history. This, the last 10 years, the last 10 years, 474,000, you're now up to 2 million. That's four times the number that existed in 1980. Uh, we now represent 21.6% of the entire population of New Jersey. One of every five people living in the state is of uh, Latino origin. We are the Northeastern state with the highest percentage of Latinos. None of the other states in the Northeast of the United States have anywhere near the percentage of Latinos uh, that New Jersey has. We have more than half a dozen cities that have more than 50% Latino population with some like Passaic and Perth Amboy, more than 80%. Right? Uh, and uh, it's an enormous growth that's occurred in just a very short period of time. Now, other communities have grown as well. The African-American community has grown as well, but because of all the gentrification and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the uh, somewhat aging of the population and people are moving down south that hasn't grown as quickly, uh, but still African-Americans are now 15% of the state. And of course, Asian-Americans have been going rapidly, uh, uh, now about 10% of the state. I've tried for the past few years to impress on my colleagues at Rutgers the significance of these figures. For an institution like the Maine Public University, even as so much attention has been placed and deservedly so on the need to remedy racial discrimination against African-Americans. Rutgers has three main campuses, Newark, Camden, New Brunswick. The public school population of Newark is 50% Latino today. That of Camden is 51% Latino, public schools. New Brunswick, 92% Latino is in the public schools of New Brunswick. So here you have in all the main cities where Rutgers is located, the overwhelming population of the potential future students of the university are Latino. And what are they doing about trying to address the educational problems and the failures of the public schools in those uh, cities? Um, uh, the fact is that too little has been done, even by the most liberal institutions and leaders to address the inequities in education that continue to plague us. Back in my activist days, when I was a leader of the Young Lords Party, we insisted that it was actions, not words, that were the true gauge of any person or institution's intentions directly improving the lives of the most marginalized was what mattered. Not whether you uttered the right phrase or label, your connection to the community was paramount. As has always been true of this library. And this library, you un must understand, is distinct from other libraries. When I was researching for a book on the media uh, and historical record of media narratives, I was astounded by how American public and university libraries never bothered to archive 
the newspapers of the black community or the Latino community or any of the records and archives of those communities. And by doing that, they erased the potential for the narrative to be developed, right? It was the libraries who had the responsibility to archive the records so that people who came later would then figure out what had actually happened. If you just don't even bother to save the archives, then you've erased those communities and their development history. So that's the Newark Public Library has for the last 40 years been distinct in seeking to preserve that narrative. And that is what is so important about the work that it's done. You could go to any number of institutions today, the state legislature, local boards of education, major nonprofits, our healthcare providers, uh, the, uh, the major media companies and corporations. You name the institution, compare its jobs profile or spending priorities against the state's rapidly changing demographic, and you'll see a gap wider than the Grand Canyon. That's the gap that has to be closed between the changing nature of the population and who is being allowed to enter the key jobs and get the contracts and, and get the recognition uh, from these major institutions. Reverend Al Sharpton used to joke about uh, Michael Bloomberg when he was mayor, that the Bloomberg administration was like the Rocky Mountains. The higher you went, the wider it got. Uh, and, uh, and you could say that pretty much about any institution uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and that therefore that is what has to change as the demographics of the country require. I mentioned this because the cancel culture has been spreading a lot of late. It's begun to take hold among many well-intentioned people and some not so well-intentioned. It's begun to create unnecessary divisions over race, gender, sexual orientation, identity, even over simple disagreements. It diverts us from the efforts to grapple with the structural basis of racial inequities. Back during the early years of the Young Lords more than 50 years ago, there were six of us in the leadership of that group. This was a Puerto Rican organization primarily, although there were many other people who were in it. Of the six people in leadership, three were Afro-Boricuas, Afro-Puerto Ricans, at a time when Black Puerto Ricans were never seen in leadership. There was Felipe Luciano, Pablo Yoruba Guzman, and Juan Fi Ortiz. One was an African-American woman, Denise Oliver. And two of us were light-skinned Puerto Ricans, myself and David Perez. 50 years ago, we were talking in the Young Lords about colonized mentality, about equality for women, about the rights of gays and lesbians, about racist views within the Latino community, about colonialism and militarism abroad. But we always did it with the aim of educating and transforming those who disagreed with us, whether within our community or outside of it. And we always understood that what united people of different races, cultures, and classes was far greater than what divided them. Some of our current generation of activists could learn from those lessons. If they spent more time reading histories, and books of that period in the library or, uh, or online and less on tweeting. Well, that was back in those days. We're supposed to be entering a new era now when the NBA and the National Basketball Association paints Black Lives Matter on its courts. And every major corporation is running ads about diversity and inclusion. 
We're supposed to be in a different era. Don't be fooled by the ads. The structural problems haven't gone away. They just disguise themselves better. And as we contemplate the past years of the growth of the Latino community, one thing you can be certain of, there's a lot more of us around to learn the lessons of the past. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Juan. Um, at this point, we invite everybody back to the reception room in Centennial Hall to listen to the sounds of Janetta Miranda. Enjoy some more food and drink until you hear the loud bell that says we're closed. <laughs> But, but before we leave, I just like to ask the speakers um, huh, and our staff if we could sit by for some pictures. Real quick, we'll be quick. <laughs> Thank you.